Mr. and Mrs. Day, Dr. Houston, students, my faculty brothers and sisters, been waiting all week to say that one. Uh, thank you, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you this afternoon and a happy Thursday to you all. Today I have two items that I would like to share with you. The first is how a Quaker meeting for worship works, how it functions, so that you can experience that a little bit. The second is to provide you with a perspective on pride and achievement, which is the theme for this week. You probably don't know it, but we've already done two things that often occur at a Quaker uh, meeting for worship. The first is when you walk in through the door, you're always greeted by someone who welcomes you in. And so my advisory did that uh, this afternoon. And the second is that we enjoy the light that is around. Light is a very central piece to the Quaker beliefs. Now, I'm not an expert on Quakers or on Quakerism, but in the Quaker way, I don't need to be a, an expert. In fact, I'm not even really a Quaker. I am what Quakers would call an attender. Basically meaning that I go to meeting. It occurs to me also that you may not be familiar with who the Quakers are or what they do. So let me take a little time to explain that. As a starting point for our understanding of Quakers and how the meeting for worship works, I'm going to give you a super simple cliff note overview of Quakerism. Let's break this into two parts. Who Quakers are and what Quakers believe. Quakers are a part of the Christian faith, kind of like Baptists, Catholics, Lutherans. Their official name is the Religious Society of Friends. So sometimes you'll hear them referred to as friends, as in like a friend's school. There are friend's schools out there. Those are Quaker schools. Quakers believe that, that, that there is that of God in everyone. And that means that everybody inside them has a little piece of something spiritual. Sometimes you can't access it, but it is there. That guides their beliefs. They often refer to that special part of you as the light or finding the light. They believe that it takes no special talent or training to understand God, to find the light, or to understand spiritual things. You don't need to be a minister, a rabbi, or an imam to help you understand these matters. It also means that an attender like me can stand up and share with you what a Quaker meeting for worship would look like, because I have no special training. Lastly, Quakers believe you need to be silent in order to hear that spiritual part of yourself. So we're going to try that here today. In a nutshell, a Quaker meeting for worship involves a lot of silent listening and reflection. Occasionally, someone will get up and share what is on their mind. In some meetings, a person will share a story, a poem, or some part of a religious text at the beginning of the meeting. In that way, everyone has something to consider while they are listening. That's called a programmed meeting, and that's what we're gonna try and do today. So, you're sitting there, probably asking yourself, what is gonna happen, and what do I need to do? All right, here's the preview. I'm gonna tell you a story. You're gonna listen to the story. That story will end with a question. When the story ends, we are going to sit silently and reflect on the question, listening for that spiritual part of us. During that reflection time, you may want to say something about the question or the story. That's perfectly okay, please do. What you'll do is stand up and wait for me to come around with a microphone so that you have that and everyone else can hear you. When you get the microphone, share what you would like, 
then sit back down. If you are not speaking, just sit and listen. There is no need to respond. It's very polite when everyone speaks in front of the crowd for us to, to give them applause. In this situation, it's not something that, that is needed. If you're in the balcony, Vincent will be up there with a the microphone, so if you feel like you'd like to share up there, Vincent will help you out with this. When we're done, we'll know the end of the reflection is done because I will ring this bowl. That will be the time that Mr. Shiver comes up here and he will, um, we will sing the cardigan hymn and it will be time to go. All right? I'm telling a story. You're sitting and reflecting. Share if you'd like. We'll ring the bell and that will we'll know that we're done. All right? Sound good? Excellent. Excellent. We're ready for the story. I'm ready for the story because this is an awesome story. But there's one little thing I have to add in. To help you with that reflection, I'd like to share with you a definition that Dr. Houston shared with us earlier in the year about pride. He said, pride is a feeling of deep pleasure or satisfaction derived from one's own achievements or the achievements of one's family or friends. Again, Pride is a feeling of deep pleasure or satisfaction. Please keep that in mind. Here we go, the story. This story is about a football player. His name is Tana Umanga. Isn't Tana a great name? It's actually my favorite name. In fact, without the same guidance of my wife, it would have been the name of my firstborn son, Tana Umanga McDonald. It's awesome. Jackson thanks his mother every day that that didn't happen. Anyway, Tana is not a real person, but the story is based on someone I know and a situation I'm familiar with. Not using the person's real name protects him from embarrassing questions about his purported talents and his faults and allows me to, embell to embellish the story a little bit. I think you will find Tala's, Tana's story familiar and unusual and perhaps as confounding as he does. I believe this story is perfect for our pride and achievement theme. So on to the story. Tana's story takes place in the fall of his senior year in high school at the end of a very successful football season. Tana is a devastating offensive lineman. He clears massive holes for the running backs to cruise through. More than one blitzing linebacker has ended up on their backsides after his devastating pass blocks. And not only is he physically talented, he knows what every position is supposed to do on any play. He knows everyone's blocking assignments. He knows the running back steps and the flankers pass routes. When there is confusion in the huddle, Tana's teammates turn to him for clarification, and he loves it. Tana is also a standout defensive end on a team that gives up 10 points. 10 points over a nine game regular season. For those of you doing the math, that's one touchdown and one field goal. His team, the Eagles, lose only one game during that regular season, a three-nothing slugfest against their arch rivals, the Bobcats. He hates the Bobcats. Throughout the season, Tana is proud of his accomplishments and his teams. He loves to see his name in the paper on Sunday and reads every word of every article written about the team. He grins from ear to ear when someone in town slaps him on the back and tells him what a good game he played on Saturday. He watches a game that was broadcast on TV, a 38 to nothing shellacking of the Green Giants, over and over again on his VCR, reliving the big hits and crushing blocks. For those of you not old enough to remember, a VCR was a way, a way to record TV and play it back kind of like an older version of TiVo. 
At the end of the season, Tana earns All-State recognition on offense and defense. He wins the Outstanding Player of the Year award from his team, and he goes on to play in an All-Star football game the following summer. Man, who wouldn't feel proud of those accomplishments? Our story takes place after the championship game. And oh, what a football game that was. His Eagles got a rematch against their arch rival, the Bobcats. Remember them? The ones he hates? For Tana and his team, it was like the big time college rivalry, rivalries they watched on TV. Alabama, Auburn, Michigan, Ohio State, USC, Notre Dame. Every Eagle, everywhere, wanted revenge for that regular season loss. Tana daydreamed of the parade that would happen after the Eagle victory. The buses following the fire trucks through town, lights flashing, fans lining the sidewalks, waving signs and flags, yelling and screaming. He wondered what he would say at the rally after the parade. But let me tell you, this was a knockdown, drag out, nail biting, fist fight of a game. It was a game in which Tana opened chasms in the Bobcats' defensive line that the fullback rumbled through for a total of 221 yards. Now, keep in mind, we are talking about the fullback. And for those of you unfamiliar with the fullback position, this is a guy who, if he were a little smarter and a little bigger, would be a lineman. And if he were a little faster and a little shiftier, he would be a tailback. So to have a guy who can't play line and can't play tailback run for 220 yards is a big deal, a really big deal. But I digress. This was a game that saw three lead changes, a blocked field goal, an interception for a touchdown. It's a game in which Tana made two quarterback sacks. The most critical one sealed the game. On a third down play, with less than a minute to go and the Eagles holding on to a 12-10 lead, the Bobcat quarterback took the ball from the center. He faked the handoff to the right and rolled out for a pass. Tana watched the QB's moves. He discarded the lineman trying to block him, then took off after the quarterback. The two of them, the quarterback and Tana, were in a foot race to the outside. Tana won. He took the QB hard to the turf. The crowd went wild. His teammates jumped and slapped his helmet. Tama, um, Tama imagined a headline in the paper the next day with his name on it. He wondered if a picture of him would be there as well. So much to be proud of. The Eagles won 12-10. Many old timers in the crowd said it was the best game in a storied rivalry. Hugs were given, tears were cried, trophies were raised. It was glorious. We join Tana in the locker room after the game. As he stands in the shower, peeling the tape off his wrists, letting the hot water wash the dirt and blood from his face, his hands, he thinks about his season, this game. As Tana stands there, after receiving compliments by coaches, sports writers, cheerleaders, old timers, and his grandfather, who traveled four hours to see his game. After an 11-1 season, after newspaper headlines, gaping holes, teammates asking him who to block and where to run, after all of this, Tana stands there in the shower, feeling empty, sad, alone. Is this what pride feels like? <laughs>